Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace with everyone. May God bless to our reading, hearing, and understanding. Thanks be to God. Friends, will you pray with me? Amazing God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you. And may your spirit lead us to celebrate the gifts of our diverse neighbors as we listen and we learn in this time of meditation what it means to integrate our faith and our political world in which we live, play, and work. Open our ears to hear, our minds to reflect, and our hearts to love every day. Amen. So I began this sermon series with the reassurance that while some of the topics that we will address in our social principles are political, I would never be taking the side of any candidate or partisan ideology. Now, I need to reiterate that this morning and emphasize that once again. As we turn to this section in our social principles entitled The Political Community. In many ways, it would be easier to skip over this section, am I right? I mean, isn't that what we want to do in every family circle or friends? I mean, for the last few years, I've been hearing, how do I have a, 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 a meal, a Thanksgiving dinner, and not talk about these issues, right? It's much easier to ignore the power keg of politics, even within our churches or the communities of faith of which we are all together universally. Especially right now during congr uh, uh, congressional hearings, war between Russia and Ukraine and our involvement or non-involvement, global fires that are, for lack of a better term, igniting climate arguments and the current economic situation that we are all experiencing globally. All political issues. But to ignore these pol politics, even within the church, would be unfaithful and incomplete. 19th century preacher Henry Ward Beecher said once that if we are going to avoid politics in the church, then we would need to avoid two-thirds of the Bible. Because the Bible talks about life, about governments, about the rich and the poor, about the hungry, and that which we are doing wrong. Folks, that's politics. The way we live and organize ourselves through governing bodies impacts every dynamic of our lives and our social communities. Even as a church, as a denomination, as a conference, as a local church in the United Methodist system, we are a human system divinely inspired and led by the Spirit, but we are a human system that has politics within it, right? Everything that we're a part of does. So the question remains, how do we talk about potentially divisive political issues within the church, within the body of Christ? 
Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King famously said, the church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and the critic of the state, and never its tool. If the church does not recapture a prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without a moral or a spiritual authority. If the church does not participate actively in the struggle for peace and for economic and racial justice, it will forfeit the loyalty of millions and cause people everywhere to say that it has atrophied its will. But if the church will free itself from the shackles of the deadening status quo and recovering its great historic mission will speak and act fearlessly and insistently in terms of justice and peace. It will enkindle the imagination of humankind and fire the souls all, imbuing them with a glowing and ardent love for truth and justice and peace. People far and near will know the church as this great fellowship, a fellowship of love that provides light and bread for lonely travelers at midnight. This is a quote from King's sermon entitled, A Knock at Midnight. And it is powerful because it challenges the very vocation and purpose of the church in society. The church that we are a part of, my friends. And I would say it helps us, in my opinion, to rename and revision who we are and who we're going to be in the days ahead. Yes, the church absolutely needs to be about pastoral care and evangelism and Christian education and service. But if the church isn't also about the discipleship toward justice, it is not foolish fully accomplishing the very work and the very calling of the church. And King's warning that people will say that the church has atrophied its will is not just a warning, but it is a reality for many. Friends, we've seen this in the great exodus of many of our younger generations, fleeing the church because it is increasingly irrelevant to their daily lives and even hypocritical. With scripture constantly returning to justice, to love your neighbor and to care for the least of these, but the church not following through by putting those teachings into practice through advocating social justice. King calls the church the conscience of the state. But you can't be the conscience and sit on the sidelines being silent. For when we sit idle, when we sit silent, We see that, we know that. And there are many churches who would choose the path of least resistance, of being quiet and apolitical. But the gospel itself has profound political implications. Following Christ means getting in the way of injustice, Or as Bonhoeffer once said, 
that to be silent means to stand on the side of the status quo. Friends, it is important to realize that a commitment to justice is not the same as, sem- as simply endorsing a specific ideolo- ideology perspective, ideological perspective, or a certain partisan agenda. We as the church should be challenging all parties to remain true to core biblical values and principles that put the marginalized and the vulnerable and the least of these at the center of our concern. We can disagree as Christians about the best ways to ultimately care for the vulnerable, the weak, the marginalized in our midst, but they should always be at the very center of our attention. And right now, they are so often at the peripheral of our priorities and not at the center. We, my friends, as people of faith, are called to speak up on the issues of injustice and oppression, and this has nothing to do with partisanship, but being prophetic, faithful act and speaking truth to the power of being the conscience of the nation, grounded in core biblical principles. That is the heart of this section of our social principles entitled Political Community. And it begins with this introduction. Each week I give you the introduction, and and I'm going to give that to you now and and tell you how it goes on in, in various directions. But I invite you also to look at them in more depth. I've included the link in the newsletter each week, so if you need that, let us know. But hear this introduction to this section of our social principles as United Methodists. While our allegiance to God takes precedent over our allegiance to any state, we acknowledge that the vital function of government as a principal vehicle for the ordering of society, because we know ourselves to be responsible to God for social and political life, we declare the following relative to, to governments. We hold governments responsible for the protection of the rights of the people to be free and fair elections and to the freedoms of speech, religion, assembly, and communications media. To the right to privacy and to the guarantee of the rights to adequate food and clothing and shelter and education and health care. The next part of the political responsibility says that the church should continually exert a strong ethical influence upon the state to support policies and programs that are just and to oppose policies and programs that are unjust which sounds a lot like King's message about the church being the conscience of the state. Then there are other sections. Sections about the church and state relationships, freedom of information and education, civil obedience and disobedience, the death penalty, criminal and restorative justice, and even military service. All of that is in this section. I am only hitting a touch of each of these sections in these sermons. This section reminds me that while there is almost a fear of talking about politics and divisive political issues in the church, our faith calls us to a moral responsibility to lift up our biblical core values of justice and care for the vulnerable that is often void in our current 
political arenas. In our baptismal covenant, my friends, we take a vow. We make a promise to ourselves, to God, and to the community. We actually make that, help make that with children, babies, adults who are brought forth for baptism. Something that's going to happen in September again here in this community. We make a promise and a vow that we will accept the freedom and the power that God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. Even and especially if the injustice and oppression are perpetrated by our own government on the vulnerable populations in its care. Friends, we need to keep in mind this call to be the conscience of this nation, of our nation, of our homeland. So what does that look like? How can we as individuals and as a faith community together advocates for justice, for care, for equal rights, for the vulnerable and the marginalized? I invite you to reconsider ignoring political conversations as much as you're tempted to do that. But rather, whenever possible, to speak about the issues of justice in a way that demonstrates the conscience, that doesn't get entangled in partisanship, partisan, partisan, polarized, or dehumanized that we see around us happening, but stays true to our core principles of love and justice. This is not easy work, my friends. But if we as people of faith won't stand up and lift up our voices for justice, then who will? If not us, then who? If not now, then when? My children's sermon today because our children aren't with us. We breezed past it. But my children's sermon today, I was going to take you, tell you guys to make as much noise as you could. Yell, scream, holler, whatever. Right? Because that's kind of the, the noise in our midst, right? I was going to tell a story about Jesus to them and see if they could hear it through all the noise around us. No one's going to tell me what story. Friends, we're having trouble hearing truly what our vision, ministry, and call by God is for us as individuals in the church because we don't want to get in that loud conversation. We don't have to get in a loud conversation, but we do have to make sure we're heard. And we do have to work at what God calls bringing forth the kingdom of God to be the salt. that is needed today. I want to close with the words of Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God? May God give us the courage to be salt and light, voices for justice and hope in our homes, in our churches, in our communities, and in the wider political world. Amen.